Ready, Hannah guy? Welcome to the noon meeting of the Rotary Club of Baton Rouge. I'm Mike Manny, your club president. Pleasure to be with you again. I uh, hope everyone is enjoying the beautiful weather we've been having because it's not going to be beautiful for much longer with our uh, anticipated uh, visit from our friend Chris Ball. So enjoy the weather while you can because the next several days may not be as attractive as it has been. Maybe a little cooler, but it won't be as attractive with the sun and other things with more showers on the way. Really excited to have you with us again. Really excited to keep in touch, to uh, continue the connection with Rotary and, and the membership as best we can, given where we are. And we're going to, as we move through these phases, we'll figure out how we come back the best way we possibly can. Uh, and know that we all are trying to figure out the best way to, best and safest way to do this. So, uh, Jody Hane will provide the invocation followed by John Chumba, who will do the pledge in the four-way test. Raise your, up your hands and put a smile on your face. I'm talking to everyone in the human race. We're proud and strong, so stand up tall. Let's all get together, bring peace to the world. There's a train of love beginning right here, so jump on to it and have no fear. It's yours, it's mine. We got the call. Let's all get together and bring peace to the world. Every man and woman, boy and girl, let's all get together and bring peace to the world. Shelter the homeless, open your door, feed the hungry, give to the poor. Offer your heart, don't think small. Let's all get together and bring peace to the world. Words by B.B. King. I, play, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Visible with liberty and justice for all. The four test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better relationships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, Jody and John. Uh, moving forward, we invite David DeArmond to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Mike. Today we have Chip Klein. Chip has served as chairman of the Louisiana Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority Board and the director of the coastal activities for the state of Louisiana since 2018. Klein oversees policy initiatives related to Louisiana's coastal program and manages the day-to-day -day operations of the governor's office of coastal activities. In this position, he is responsible for integrating the functions of all state agencies as they relate to coastal protection and has been integral in advancing the objectives of the state's coastal master plan in Louisiana and Washington, D.C. He works closely alongside Louisiana's congressional delegation and the Louisiana legislature to advance policy supported of Louisiana's coastline. Klein has successfully negotiated policy initiatives related to permits for hurricane protection and coastal restoration projects, issues regarding the engineering, design, and implementation of the mid-basin sediment diversions, strategy and negotiations related to the Restore Act, efforts to increase the federal revenue coming to Louisiana through the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, and the successful passage of CPRA's master and annual plans and other legislation through the Louisiana State Legislature. Klein represents Governor John Bell Edwards on the Governor's Advisory Commission on Coastal Protection, Restoration, and Conservation, the Louisiana State Mineral and Energy Board, and the Gulf Coast Ecosystem Restoration Council. He is married to Emily May Klein, father to Sydney and Henry, and is an active member of Our Lady of Mercy Catholic Church. Chip. 
Well, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and I appreciate you filling in for Edmund, who we just learned was in a uh, car accident earlier, and uh, so I appreciate the introduction. And I also want to thank all the members of the Rotary Club for giving me the opportunity to present today. I've uh, long had an interest in presenting to this group, uh, and so I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about one of the most important issues that's facing the state of Louisiana. Today, I wanna to talk about South Louisiana, and particularly, I wanna talk about Louisiana's coast. And those of us that call South Louisiana home know that uh, we are no stranger to disasters. Uh, and on April 20th of this year, we as a state had the opportunity to reflect on the 10 year anniversary of the BP oil spill. The BP oil spill was an unprecedented environmental disaster. It was the worst natural disaster in our nation's history. But at the end of the day, the BP oil spill, um, while it was an extensive um, disaster, it also was a disaster that resulted in a great opportunity for the state of Louisiana. And for those of us that work within the state's coastal program, who work tirelessly every day to restore and protect coastal Louisiana. So I'm going to uh, go through a few slides here uh, to kind of talk about uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, to talk about some of the various issues that we face across coastal Louisiana, and then the amount of tremendous progress uh, that the state's coastal program is making in restoring and protecting coastal Louisiana. So let me see if I can get my PowerPoint up here. Okay, so we begin uh, this morning uh, in a way in which we begin every presentation on this issue. Uh, and this slide uh, is what has happened to our coast since the 1930s. The fact that we have lost over 2,000 square miles of land off of coastal Louisiana. That is the equivalent of losing the size of the state of Delaware. To put that more into a local perspective, 2,000 square miles is the equivalent of losing St. Charles, St. James, St. John, East Baton Rouge, and East Feliciana parishes. And so while this may scare you, uh, this next slide is what should really keep you up at night. And the fact is, is that if, if we do nothing over the next 50 years, if we do not implement a single coastal restoration or hur hurricane protection project across coastal Louisiana, we stand to lose an additional 4,000 square miles of land. To put 4,000 square miles of land into a more local perspective, that is the equivalent of losing the parishes of Point Capi, St. Helena, West Feliciana, Tangibaho, Washington, Livingston, and St. Tammany parishes. So undoubtedly a very scary scenario for the people uh, that call South Louisiana home. And so the causes of that land loss are, as, as, are due to a variety of factors. Number one, uh, we know that um, every year we have hurricanes that uh, cross uh, South Louisiana. We are actually tracking a hurricane right now in uh, Cristobal that um, will we'll be here before we know it sometime over the weekend. And I'll be providing an update uh, on that storm at the end of the presentation. But the land loss is really caused by sea level rise, which can be a hot potato issue in the political realm. But those of you who spend a lot of time on, in South Louisiana and along our coast, you cannot argue with the fact that the Gulf of Mexico is rising. It continues to encroach upon our communities where our people live and work. Subsidence, which is the natural sinking of land in coastal Louisiana, uh, where our land is literally subsiding um, across our coast. And then oil and gas infrastructure. Uh, while a critical component of our economy um, the, the digging and the dredging of canals and the laying of pipelines and oil and gas exploration has allowed, allowed for saltwater intrusion to enter into our fresh estuaries, which has caused for uh, deterioration of our wetlands. But the primary uh, factor of land loss across coastal Louisiana was primarily due to the levying of the Mississippi River. Many people don't realize that the Mississippi River literally built the state of Louisiana. 
uh, after thousands of years of the Mississippi River depositing sediment across our coast, it literally over thousands of years built the land we stand on. And after the flood of 1927, when the federal government levied the Mississippi River, it cut off that sediment supply and that freshwater from supply from continuing um, to build land on a yearly rate. So a variety of factors are, are the reasons uh, for why we see uh, land loss across our coast today. But the fact is, is that it's not just about land loss uh, and environmental and creating habitat and creating wetlands or saving um, our estuaries. The more land we lose, the more susceptible and the more vulnerable we become as a state to hurricanes and flooding. And so this graph shows that over the next 50 years, if we do not implement a single coastal restoration or hurricane protection project, what the flood depths could be across our coast uh, as a result of a 100 year level of a storm, which was equivalent to the storm um, such as Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. So you can see areas across our coast that where a storm would come um, online to where you could have over 15 feet of storm surge across coastal Louisiana. If you look more up into the capital area uh, around the Lake Maurepas area, uh, you can see even in there, as far up north as the Lake Maurepas, 13 to 15 feet of storm sur surge would be associated with a 100 year level storm if the state of Louisiana does not take action. And so one of the things that I want to um, focus on today is a lot of people who call South Louisiana home and who live in, in the state of Louisiana don't recognize just how important coastal Louisiana and South Louisiana is to the rest of our state, to the entire Gulf Coast region, and to the, our entire country. Two million people call South Louisiana home. 20% of the nation's waterborne commerce comes through Louisiana's coast. We have the largest port complex in the world. Five of the top 15 um, ports in the country are located in South Louisiana. 26% of the commercial fisheries uh, in the continental United States come from South Louisiana. Our commercial fishing industry ranks one or two, depending on what year you're looking at, uh, and revenue generated from commercial fisheries. And of course, those of you who enjoy uh, duck hunting, we have over 5 million migratory waterfowl that depend on South Louisiana habitat. So we, it is a critical, critical component um, for the economic vitality of the Gulf Coast and the entire uh, United States. Off of our coast, there exists literally thousands of miles of pipeline that support the oil and gas industry uh, that literally fuel this country. 90% of the deep water oil and gas production uh, in the Gulf of Mexico is serviced out of Port Fouchon. 70% of the oil and gas that comes from the Gulf of Mexico is transported through coastal Louisiana to refineries across our country. If you look at uh, truck cargo flows, the amount of goods and commodities that come from various ports that are transported onto highways and dispersed across areas um, in other areas across our country. This is a graph that came out of the United States Department of Transportation that shows the truck cargo flows out of the state of New York. Same concept out of Southern California. Same out of Houston. This is a graph that depicts the truck cargo flows that come out of the city of New Orleans alone. If you take into account all of the ports and all of the truck cargo flows that come from South Louisiana, that's what this graph looks like. So it can be argued that South Louisiana literally feeds and fuels this country. The same applies for freight um, that is transported by water. And if you look at uh, the different uh, major navigation channels across uh, the country, you can undoubtedly see that uh, the Mississippi River is a major, major corridor for the transportation of goods and commodities to the rest of the country. And so, as I mentioned um, earlier this year on April 20th, uh, we had the opportunity to reflect on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was really our aha moment, if you will, uh, and made us realize just how fragile coastal Louisiana is how important South Louisiana is to the rest of our state, 
but it also made us realize why we fight so hard within CPRA to restore and protect our coast. And so if I could get um, to Hag to key up the, uh, the video, uh, it's a two to three minute video here that I'd like to share uh, that allows for a little bit of a reflection April 20, on the BP oil spill. 2010, 9.45 p.m. 41 miles off Louisiana's coast, the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig is rocked by a sudden violent blowout, killing 11 men on board. Massive oil spill in the Gulf, which is now 130 miles long, blowing this oil, this sludge, causing catastrophic damage into the bayous of southeastern Louisiana. America has never experienced an event like this before. In the 87 days that followed, over 200 million gallons of crude oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico in what's been called the worst environmental disaster in United States history. Tens of thousands of animals died. Water quality degraded, damaging our natural defenses, leaving us more vulnerable to storms and hurricanes. The spill delivered immediate catastrophic impacts to the multi-billion dollar Gulf fishing and tourism industries. But even as we face the incredible challenge of removing nearly 10 million pounds of oily residue from our shorelines, the people of Louisiana were resilient. And in the early days after the disaster, showed our spirit to begin the long process of recovery. In April 2016, after years of litigation, the court awarded damages to the affected Gulf states, the largest environmental damage settlement in U.S. history. In all, Louisiana is getting the biggest amount for the restoration of our coast, $7.29 billion appropriated through year 2031. And we were ready. Armed with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authorities, comprehensive coastal master plan. CPRA and our partners began a series of cutting edge projects to restore and protect what makes this region so special. We are constructing thousands of acres of Barrier Island Beach, dunes, and marsh to defend Louisiana's working coast against hurricanes. We are reconnecting the Mississippi River to its historic Delta region we've prioritized re-establishing fish and other wildlife habitats, especially those species impacted by the disaster. And billions of dollars in additional projects will set Louisiana's coast on a new trajectory for decades to come. 10 years after Deepwater Horizon, there's a rising tide of hope and optimism on our own horizon. World-class science and engineering are driving protection projects to mitigate the impacts of the spill and make our coast more resilient against future challenges. Preserving our coast requires significant investment over the next several decades, and the lessons we've learned will guide our path forward. Through it all, Louisiana's coastal communities will continue to do what they've always done, adapt, pull together, persevere because it's our fault and our future. So one of the things that I wanna um, just make note of is that no matter what the people uh, of South Louisiana are faced with, no matter what, whether it's a a hurricane, a natural disaster, an oil spill, a pandemic. Um, our coast and the people who call South Louisiana, Louisiana home will never be a lost cause. Um, and what inspires me every day to go to work on behalf of the people who call South Louisiana home or just how resilient the people of this state are. Um, and so in the immediate months and days after uh, the BP oil spill. Um, you may ask, how do you address a problem as large in scale as coastal land loss? And how do you address or respond to the largest environmental disaster in our nation's history? 
Uh, and the answer to that question is the state's coastal master plan. Uh, our master plan is our 50 year um, plan that calls for $50 billion worth of hurricane protection and coastal restoration projects across our coast. The first master plan was developed in 2007. It is updated every five years. So the second edition was done in 2012. And then Governor Edwards um, led the effort uh, for the 2017 Coastal Master Plan. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that um, since 2007, every single plan has received unanimous approval by the Louisiana legislature. And if you're familiar with Louisiana politics, you know that it is unheard of to have a $50 billion plan um, get unanimous approval by uh, elected officials in the state legislature. And I think that really speaks to, number one, the importance of the issue, and number two, the broad uh, bipartisan support that the Coastal Program continues uh, to enjoy and worked hard over the last several uh, years to achieve. So in total, the Coastal Master Plan is 124 projects yeah, fully implemented. Uh, it would reduce annual flood damages by $150 billion and would create over 802 square miles of land. And so you may remember that when we talked about um, the fact that we've lost over 2,000 square miles of land since the 1930s, and you may ask, well, why are we only restoring 800 square miles? And the fact of the matter is this, is that we will never have the coast that we had back in the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, or 60s. But we can have a coast that restores um, a large portion of coastal Louisiana by making sustainable investments in strategic areas across our coast and investing in projects that will protect the overwhelming majority of people who live across South Louisiana. So the master plan, while $50 billion, $25 billion is spent on coastal restoration projects where we're pumping sediment from offshore to uh, inland through marsh creation projects, uh, where we're spending money through some of the sediment diversion projects, where we're reconnecting the Mississippi River to its coastal marshes, um, and something I'll touch on a little bit later. But then the other $25 billion is actually what we call the risk reduction or the hurricane protection side of the house, where we're investing in levees and flood walls, pump stations, floodgates, and large-scale hurricane protection systems, similar to the one that was built after Hurricane Katrina uh, after around the greater New Orleans area. And so this isn't just a plan that sits on a shelf in Baton Rouge. Uh, since 2007, we've secured over $20 billion with a B for these types of projects. We have secured over 150 million, 57 million cubic yards of material that has created nearly 50,000 acres of land. We've built or improved over 327 miles of levee and created over 60 miles of barrier islands, which our barrier islands are our first line of defense, a string of barrier islands that really serve as that first uh, speed bump, if you will, when a hurricane is approaching uh, South Louisiana. And so just some before and after pictures um, of projects that we have implemented over the last several years. This is an area in the Barataria Basin land bridge. You can see uh, the before and after uh, there. Um, once the vegetation continues uh, to grow. Uh, this is an area um, in Lake Hermitage, uh, which was funded with BP oil spill dollars. And well, I'll just point out these, these pictures are taken from um, a helicopter high in the air. You really can't get the scope, the full scope and scale of these projects unless you see them in person. Um, and so we spend a lot of time and effort taking members of Congress, congressional delegation staffers, out to see these projects so they can see just the scope and scale and how impressive these projects really are. Uh, but this is a project that was funded as, the, as a result of the BP oil spill settlement. Uh, Marsh creation, you can see the before and after uh, there. Uh, Bayou DuPont, just in Plaquemines Parish, where we were pumping sediment out of the Mississippi River over 13 miles into Bayou DuPont. Here's a picture of what that area looked like in 2010 and again in 2016. Uh, further southwest, um, a little bit of a different landscape in southwest Louisiana where we fo really focus on shoreline protection, where we're rocking the shoreline there in southwest Louisiana 
Uh, you can see the, the yellow line at the, the bottom portion of the screen there where we um, extended the parish shoreline there in Cameron Parish. And then I'll also point out uh, the marsh that is behind uh, that yellow line. So here's a before and an after picture where you can see that beach headland there, which was refurbished um, through pumping sediment, is also um, placing rock along that shoreline, as well as the, uh, the marsh that was refurbished and restored uh, behind that critical highway. I believe that's Highway 82 that cuts across uh, Cameron Parish. Uh, Kamenata Headlands, uh, to this date, it is the largest restoration project that we have built within CPRA. It is a critical beach headland project that um, protects one of the most critical um, economic assets in South Louisiana, Port Fouchon. And you can see this is actually an active construction site when the project was under construction. Uh, and what phase one, which is in the, the near part of the picture here, looks like uh, after construction. And then you can see in the foreground at the top of the picture, which was phase two. This project is now fully completed. It's over 13 miles of beach headland uh, and dune habitat that was refurbished and restored, uh, which will continue to protect uh, Port Fouchon, which uh, again services 90% of the oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico. You may have seen some recent media reports on a migratory bird habitat, to Queen Bess, which is uh, near Grand Isle in, in Jefferson Parish. Um, this symbolic picture of the brown pelican that was oiled, that was um, shown all over national media and international media outlets during the spill, uh, was a picture that was taken at Queen Bess Island. Uh, that experience uh, significant um, oiling during the spill uh, and as a result further exacerbated many of the factors that were causing its deterioration uh, in that area. Uh, and as a result of the BP oil spill settlement again we were able to restore over 30 acres uh, about 18.5 million dollars uh, and we were very pleased to announce that literally thousands of brown pelican, Louisiana state bird, uh, returned to this island during nesting season. Uh, one of the pelicans, which had a pink band on its leg, a pink band symbolizes that it was actually a bird that was oiled during the spill, uh, was brought into a lab clean, uh, was brought back to health, and then released back into the wild. Uh, and there are many pictures on the CPRE Facebook page of the thousands of brown pelicans that are now nesting once again on Queen Bess. As I mentioned, significant investment has been made along our barrier islands against our, our first line of defense across coastal Louisiana. This is Whiskey Island, um, just south of uh, Terrebonne Parish. This is a picture taken in 2007. And once again, as we uh, finished its restoration in 2019. So one of the most uh, exciting things uh, about the coastal program right now is that an overwhelming majority of our expenditures are actually going to the construction of hurricane protection and coastal restoration projects. You will see in fiscal year 21, which is the, the when you hear about the legislature uh, passing budgets and looking at fiscal bills and things of that nature, they're talking about fiscal year 21, which is the fiscal year that the state will start on July 1st. Over 74% of our entire budget, 1.08 billion will be spent on the actual construction of projects. And if you look at over the next uh, two years, uh, that percentage continues to increase up to 87% of our entire budget will be spent on the construction uh, of these projects. So it's an exciting time for us in the coastal program to be working on these issues and implementing game changing projects um, that will be um, have a lasting impact across coastal Louisiana. So just in the first quarter of this year alone, $147 million of projects uh, were put out for bid. For any of you that are working in the construction industry or the engineering um, industry, uh, these are major projects. I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the economic opportunities and the job creation opportunities that come from this type of investment and these types of projects that are being built across our coast. But again, $147 million worth of projects were put out for bid from January to March uh, of this year. In April of June, uh, the current time period that we're in right now, 100 additional $120 million worth of projects were put out for bid and construction contracts. 
And things really get kicked into high gear later this summer uh, from July, December, where we have over $850 million worth of construction contracts are going to be put on the street for restoration and protection projects. And these projects span all the way from Cameron and Calcasieu parishes all the way across South Central Louisiana into Plaquemine and St. Bernard parishes. Uh, levy projects in Lafitte, uh, I'll point out the Barataria Basin Ridge and Marsh Creation Project, the Spanish Pass, which will be the largest coastal restoration project, the largest marsh creation project we will ever implement in the history of, our, of the coastal program, as well as large scale hurricane protection and coastal restoration projects in Terrebonne and Lafourche parishes. Um, we continue, uh, while we've made significant investments in our barrier islands, uh, we continue uh, over the next several years of uh, making investments in and around the perimeter of our state. Over $160 million for three barrier island projects just south of Terrebonne Parish, uh, Trinity, Timbalier, and West Bell Headland uh, will be going to construction in short order. We also continue to focus on protecting uh, South Louisiana residents from hurricanes. Um, really the crown jewel of hurricane protection system exists around the greater New Orleans area and the hurricane risk reduction system that was built after Hurricane Katrina, a $14 billion investment that was made around that area as a result of the devastation that occurred during the 2005 hurricane. Uh, recently, we were very pleased to announce in working with members of our congressional delegation and securing $760 million for the West Shore Hurricane Protection Project, which will protect the parishes of St. John, St. Charles, and St. James parishes. Additionally, it's very, uh, what's very important to note on this slide that while you see the, the yellow and red um, line there that, that shows the levee alignment that will be built, you also see that darker green area, which is a diversion outfall area. And that diversion outfall area is a result of the Mississippi reintroduction in the Maripal Swamp, a critical restoration project for that area, which will be built in conjunction with that hurricane protection project. And so we call that integrated coastal protection. When you're restoring the environment through restoration projects, but also building large scale hurricane protection projects through levees pump stations and flood walls as well. And so moving forward, um, as a result of the BP oil spill funding, over $7.25 billion that will be coming to the state of Louisiana over the next 15 years. Uh, some of the largest restoration projects that are, will be constructed anywhere in the country will be built right here in South Louisiana. And the Spanish Pass increment is on the West Bank in Plaquemines Parish, which will restore uh, close to 1,300 acres of marsh and wetlands in that area. Um, the law, another large-scale Barataria Marsh Creation Project in Plaquemines Parish, another um, several thousand acres of marsh will be will, will be built in that area. Uh, Lake Barn Marsh Creation Project in St. Bernard. Um, it's also important to note that as we continue to work through our way through this pandemic, that we have not had any project interruptions, that the coastal engine continues to churn and we continue to invest in these projects uh, to restore and protect coastal Louisiana. I do want to spend a little time here um, when we're, we're talking to the Baton Rouge Rotary. And one of the most exciting things that we have uh, going within the city of Baton Rouge is, is the water campus which is housed right here in Baton Rouge, just uh, by the Mississippi River Bridge. If you pass over the Mississippi River Bridge, you can see uh, that beautiful building that was built on the levee. Uh, that is actually the Water Institute of the Gulf. But there is a larger water campus uh, where the CPRA is housed, uh, the LSU Center for River Studies, where we have a, a model of the Mississippi River. And the water campus really serves as a hub of collaboration where we can bring scientists, engineers, Research, uh, researchers, uh, experts from around the globe right here to Baton Rouge to study the various issues that we face across our coast. And so one of the things that we've come to recognize uh, by working uh, with um, private sector individuals and academic institutions is the economic impact that coastal restoration and hurricane protection projects have on our economy in this state. 
So as a result of previous spending years, um, where our annual budget has been anywhere from $630 million to $840 million, that generates up to $460 to $620 million in wages each year. $1.1 to $1.5 billion in annual output. Uh, and $590 to $785 million in value added to the state's economy, which support uh, close to 10,500 jobs each year uh, with an average wage of about $59,000. So as we see other areas of our economy start to struggle as a result of the pandemic and the decline in oil and gas prices, uh, the water sector, if you will, uh, the restoration and um, hurricane protection sector, sector um, on, on these types of projects continues to thrive, mainly because of the large investments that we're making across our coast. I just want to highlight two projects specifically. Uh, I mentioned the two sediment diversion projects that we're building along the Mississippi River, where we're reconnecting the river to its deltaic plain, to the marshes, uh, one project is going to be the uh, Mid-Breton sediment diversion is on the East Bank and the Mid-Breton, excuse me, the Mid-Barataria sediment diversion on the West Bank. These two projects alone, $1.85 billion will be expended by CPRA on construction efforts over the next seven years. That will result in $3.1 billion increase in sales. $809 million increase in household earnings and will support over 2,200 jobs per year on average. And that economic forecast was done by a very well-respected uh, economist, Dr. Lauren Scott. And so these are the type of economic opportunities that continue to exist as a result of the work that we're doing within CPRA. I also think it's important to focus on that we're not just focused on the here and now, uh, that we're not just focusing on the projects that we're implementing today and over the next several months. We really are operating with a long-term vision um, here within the state's coastal program. Earlier this year, the governor announced um, a series of policy priorities that he will focus on in his next four years as governor. Uh, and I think it's very important that we continue to build resilience. Resilience has really become a buzzword um, within this sector. Uh, but it's not just about restoring the environment. It's not just about building large scale hurricane protection projects, but it's also ensuring that our economy is resilient, that we can withstand natural disasters. It's also important that our state government is functioning in a way in a coordinated fashion to where DOTD is taking into account information that we have in the coastal master plan and how and where they build roads and bridges, how the department of Wildlife and Fisheries is issuing oyster leases based upon where we're working and doing our restoration projects across the coast. Uh, another important initiative the governor announced was really a focus, an increased focus on the Atchafalaya Basin. Um, many people who, who live and work in Baton Rouge spend a lot of time in the basin. And I think it's really one area of our coast uh, that we really don't have our head around. Uh, every other basin of our coast, uh, we know what projects need to be implemented. We know what measures we need to, uh, to implement to address the issues that we face in those specific areas. But the Atchafalaya Basin in and of itself is a tremendous source of sediment. And looking how do you get that sediment out of the basin and transporting it to other areas across our coast is going to be an important um, effort of ours and an important focus of ours over the next several years. Obviously, I've talked a lot about the seafood industry. Uh, when you are implementing restoration projects, you have to keep in mind our seafood industry, particularly the oyster industry, which continues to rely on a certain salinity to harvest oysters. Um, I don't know about you, but I certainly love some, some, uh, some Louisiana oysters, and um, I think it's got to be a goal for, uh, for ours over the next several years to have a sustainable oyster industry that can coexist with coastal restoration projects um, moving forward. I think it's also important that we continue to grow, diversify, and protect the economy uh, through coastal investments and coordinated advocacy and continue to be a hub for uh, innovation and collaboration. So I wanna leave you with three uh, parting thoughts, if you will, three takeaways from this presentation. And number one, the issue of hurricane protection and coastal restoration is an existential issue. 
too many people that call Louisiana home look at this issue as strictly an environmental and conservation type issue. This is an issue about our survival. This is an issue about our way of life, where you literally, if we do nothing, our state is going to wash away. And if you recall what I said earlier about the economic importance, the importance of coastal Louisiana to the economy across the Gulf Coast, that's why we pay so much attention to this issue. And so while there are countless priorities across state government from uh, roads and bridges and healthcare and higher education uh, and prisons, you name it, those things are all important. They deserve our attention, but they're worth nothing if they're underwater. And that's why this issue has got to be at the forefront of coastal of, of state government uh, for years to come. Number two, we are making unprecedented progress in our efforts to restore and protect coastal Louisiana. We have more projects under construction than any other time in the history of our state. If you paid attention to Governor Edwards' inaugural address, over the next four years, we will break ground on projects that will ultimately restore more land than we expect to lose. And that is the first time that we can say that since the 1930s. Over $1 billion in expenditures over the next several years will be implemented, will be used to implement some of the largest projects in our history. And number three, it's important to notice, note that we are focused on the long-term sustainability of coastal Louisiana through resilience, uh, through reducing emissions. Um, up to this point, uh, the state of Louisiana has largely been reacting to the effects of climate change and sea level rise, but has done nothing to address the causes of it. And this can really be a political hot potato, but we enjoy a very um, good working relationship with the oil and gas sector here in, in Louisiana, and they will be collaborating with us on how we can reduce emissions over the next several years so that we're addressing the causes of climate change and the causes of the continued degradation across our coast. And then obviously we want to maintain and focus on the economic opportunities that result from our work. So I would ask that you continue to follow our work uh, when it comes to hurricane protection and coastal restoration. We really are all in this together. And I will close with just a quick briefing on uh, Cristobal. Uh, we just got off of a briefing with Governor Edwards um, and the Unified Command Group. We continue to monitor what that storm is going to do based upon its current trajectory. Uh, it is headed right at us. Um, and so the main concern here uh, at within state government is how fast the storm is going to move. Right now, the storm is moving very slowly. Um, and when you have a storm that moves that slowly, obviously the concern will be the amount of rainfall uh, that is going to be dumped in areas across South Louisiana. And so we have um, tested all of our hurricane protection systems in coordination with the federal government and local levy districts. Uh, we are prepared, but it's important for everybody in the state of Louisiana to get a game plan uh, that you have a plan on what you and your family will do in the event of a hurricane. And so again, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Um, and I will be happy to take any questions uh, from the audience. Okay, so um, we have several questions. First one from Matt Lynch. How are we collaborating with scientists in the Netherlands for these projects and are we learning from them? So uh, excellent question. So I, I think when it comes to um, other areas um, across the globe uh, on being, being lead, leading experts on this issue, on how do you um, live on a delta, restore a delta, live with water, manage water. I think you don't have to look any further to the Dutch. Um, they have experienced some significant um, devastation as a result of, of storms and, and natural disasters in that area. Uh, I have been over there and met with the officials from, um, from that area and kind of how they are using uh, nature and the natural processes um, from sediment to restore um, their, their coastline uh, and their portions of their uh, country that continue to remain vulnerable 
um, to hurricanes and storms and degradation for, to the environment. I will also say that the Water Institute of the Gulf is really um, a concept that was developed as a result of going over uh, to meet with the Dutch. Uh, Del Taro's is the leading expert when it comes to these issues and the Water Institute of the Gulf was really formed to mimic um, that uh, entity over in the Netherlands that serves as that hub of collaboration and scientific information, which helps inform um, the government on where and how to make investments. So we have actually signed a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with Del, Taro, Del Taurus, uh, and we can continue to collaborate on, uh, with the Dutch government on, on how we can learn from one another. Uh, they continue to send individuals over here to be housed at the Water Institute. And so there's extensive collaboration that not only takes place there, but with other leading experts across the globe when it comes to this issue. Okay, so the next question comes from Marvin Borgmeier. He's got, that's a two-part question. Um, if $7 billion comes from BP, where does the rest of the $50 billion come from? And also, how are the projects prioritized? Sure, excellent question. So the, the overwhelming majority of our funds do come from the BP oil spill. Um, we do receive um, an annual allocation from state government, from state mineral revenues, from revenues that are generated on state land, state water bottom oil and gas production. Uh, that is only about 15 to $25 million per year. Uh, another large portion of our revenue comes from the federal government uh, through what we call the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, uh, from oil and gas production off of our co outer continental shelf. Uh, where the federal government shares 37.5% of revenues uh, generated from oil and gas production with the four Gulf producing states. So last year we got about $140 million as a result of the, uh, of the GoMesa revenue stream. Um, the last two years we have received an annual um, allocation from uh, surplus uh, here in, in the state of Louisiana that was realized from a previous fiscal year. And so while we don't have $50 billion sitting in the Coastal Trust Fund, and we have not identified a full, the full allocation of $50 billion, um, we don't need all $50 billion today. Uh, we need to, this is a marathon, it's, it's not a sprint, uh, and we need to stay on track over a 50-year planning horizon to do about a billion dollars worth of work a year. And so this year we have a billion dollars worth of um, expenditures um, as a result of the various funding streams that I just outlined. Um, but it's also important to note that when the BP oil spill dollars um, dry up, when we, which will be in 2032, they're paid out over 15 years, uh, we have to figure out where we're going to make up that loss in revenue from. And that's why you see us spending a tremendous amount of time in Washington, D.C., meeting with members of Congress, on how we're using the revenues from the federal government that are shared with the Gulf states, on how we're being responsible in investing those dollars back into the coast. That number one, that is just number one, sustaining the infrastructure that allows for that production to take place to begin with, but then also showing the federal government how we're investing those dollars in hurricane protection projects that protect the citizens uh, from hurricanes and storms. And when you're not making pro -invest, proactive investments like that, and you're waiting on natural disasters and hurricanes to occur without making those investments, you're going to spend exponentially more money responding to those disasters rather than making those if you would have made those proactive investments on the front end. And so, um, again, we don't have all $50 billion identified, uh, but over the next 15 years, uh, we have identified close to $18 billion uh, that will be uh, sustaining this agency and this effort over the next several years. Which that's kind of parlays into Steve Webb's question. The investment in these projects is impressive. What is the sustainability of the project results and what assurances do we have that the next hurricane doesn't destroy the efforts that we've, we've already accomplished? So excellent question. So anytime that we are um, engineering or designing these types of projects, we, would want, we want to ensure that we are taking all environmental scenarios into account. We want to take the rate of subsidence into account. We want to take 
uh, the rate of sea level rise into account to where we're talking about uh, how high or what elevation these projects are being built at. And so we are, when we construct these projects, we are looking at a long-term um, scientific information data that is, that is given to us from various um, researcher institutions and, and academic institutions, uh, including the Water Institute of the Gulf, to make sure that we are taking into account all of the environmental scenarios to ensure that these projects are sustainable. So, for example, a marsh creation project where we're pumping sediment out of the Mississippi River or pumping sediment from offshore into our, into our marshes. The lifespan of that project is anywhere from 25 to 30 years. However, as a result of the uh, diversion projects where we are reconnecting the Mississippi River, not only are you building new land by mimicking that natural process, you're also helping to sustain the land that you're building through other delivery mechanisms like marsh creation where you're dredging and pumping that sediment. So when you take um, the Mississippi River and the diversions and you're sustaining those projects, you extend uh, the lifespan of those projects uh, to probably 50 to 55 years. But it's also important for the public to know that this isn't just a one and done. You're not, you're not gonna have uh, $50 billion uh, invested in South Louisiana, and then we can all walk away and go home. There is always going to be a continual effort to restore and protect coastal Louisiana. Um, and so we are in this for the long haul, um, but I can tell you that we are making strategic investments. We are making investments that are sustainable, um, that restore the overwhelming majority of coastal Louisiana and protect um, the citizens um, of our state. David Culpepper uh, had a statement. He said all of CPRA's projects in total will result in the largest coastal restoration effort in world history. That is, that is true. That is true. I'm not aware of any other uh, restoration program that are implementing the types of projects that we're implementing, nor uh, at the scale or capacity uh, that, we are, that we are doing. We are, we are literally... Um, in my opinion, leading the world. I think while the Dutch have a little bit more experience um, in gathering the scientific information, uh, but I think from an implementation standpoint and actually addressing the issues um, and implementing solutions to the problems we face, I think we are undoubtedly leading the world uh, on that front. One last question uh, from Shard Richard. I said, Chip, you've given an, us an outstanding presentation. Please tell us what led you to this line of work and thank you for your great service to our state. Well, thank you for that. Um, what really led me to this, to this line of work was I, um, I graduated from LSU uh, in 2003 and immediately upon graduating, I received a, I got a job uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, where I was working on various uh, federal policy issues. And I was in Washington, D.C. when Hurricane Katrina hit. Uh, and my wife, Emily, and I, um, we got married in August of 2005, and um, Hurricane Katrina hit uh, at the end of August. And so watching the devastation that unfolded um, on national media outlets and what I was witnessing um, sitting in Washington, D.C., I knew that when I moved back home, that that's something I wanted to be a part of um, because I knew that um, our way of life, um, the whole way in which the state of Louisiana and state government uh, approached hurricane preparedness um, was going to change. And it was going to be a massive, massive undertaking um, at the federal and state level uh, for us to restructure the way in which we approach this issue. Uh, and so luckily enough, I, um, we moved back home uh, in 2008, and I immediately uh, made an effort to get on then Governor Bobby Jindal's transition team, uh, where I began working with um, then Garrett Graves, who's now Congressman Garrett Graves, on the transition team on identifying policy issues that we needed to pursue as a state to further stand up uh, the coastal program. And so I've been with the coastal program since 2008. 
uh, and have uh, been working tirelessly every day since. Um, and so that's really how I came into the fold, was working on federal policy issues. I got to know Congressman Graves uh, and have managed to uh, stay on board through multiple gubernatorial administrations. Um, and it's, uh, in my opinion, it's one of the greatest issues to be working on because I have the opportunity to really uh, interact and engage with every single stakeholder group and interest group that you can imagine uh, in the state of Louisiana, because this is an issue that affects all of us. Chip, thank, thank you so much for sharing CPRA's, CPRA's great progress in uh, trying to protect us from uh, the elements, if you will, keeping it that simple. We really appreciate it. Excellent presentation. Uh, we were very excited to have, have you join us uh, and share that great information with us. Yes, sir. Thank you again for having me. Okay, next week, we're going to have our own Paul Arrigo uh, from Visit Baton Rouge to talk about Baton Rouge recovery, rediscovery, uh, and tell us what it looks like on the hotel, visit uh, visitors, travel industry, and other things that uh, will be affecting us as we go forward and move forward with recovery. So look forward to speaking to you again. Uh, everybody, be careful, be safe, especially this weekend with uh, our potential visit from Cristobal. Thanks.